Hello, this is Louise Hay. Thoughts we choose to think are the tools that we use to paint the canvas of our lives. I remember when I first heard that I could change my life if I was willing to change my thinking. It was quite a revolutionary idea to me. I lived in New York and discovered the Church of Religious Science. Often people confuse the Church of Religious Science, or Science of Mind, which was founded by Ernest Holmes, with the Christian Science Church founded by Mary Baker Eddy. The Science of Mind has ministers and practitioners who carry on the teachings of the Church of Religious Science. They all reflect new thought, however they are different philosophies. They were the very first people who told me that my thoughts shaped my future. Even though I didn't understand what they meant, this concept touched what I call the inner ding within me. That place of intuition that is referred to as the voice within. Over the years, I've learned to follow it because when that ding goes yes, even if it seems a crazy choice, I know that it is right for me. So these concepts struck a chord in me. Something said, yes, they are right. And then I began the adventure of learning how to change my thinking. Once I accepted the idea and said yes to it, I went through the house. I read a lot of books and my home became like many of yours, filled with masses of spiritual and self-help books. I went to classes for many years, and I explored everything related to the subject. I literally immersed myself in new thought philosophy, a new way of thinking. It was the first time that I had really studied in my life. Up until then, I didn't believe in anything. My mother was a lapsed Catholic, and my stepfather was an atheist. I had some strange idea that Christians either wore hair shirts or were eaten by lions, and neither appealed to me. I really delved into science of mind because that was an avenue that was open for me at the time, and I found it really wonderful. At first, it was sort of easy. I grasped a few concepts, and I started to think and talk a little bit differently. In those days, I was a constant complainer and full of self-pity. I just loved to wallow in the pits. I didn't know that I was continually perpetuating more experiences in which to pity myself. But then again, I didn't know any better in those days. Gradually, I found that I was no longer complaining quite so much. I started to listen to what I said. I became aware of my self-criticism and I tried to stop it. I began to babble affirmations without quite knowing what they meant. I started with the easy ones, of course, and a few small changes began to take place. I got the green lights and the parking places and boy, did I think I was hot stuff. Wow, I thought I knew it all and I very soon became quite cocky and arrogant and dogmatic in my beliefs. I felt I knew all the answers. In hindsight, it was really my way of feeling safe in this new area. When we start to move away from some of our old rigid beliefs, especially if we've been previously in total control, it can be very scary. It was very frightening for me so I would grasp onto whatever would make me feel safe. It was a beginning for me, and I still had a long way to go, and I still do. Like most of us, I didn't always find the pathway easy and smooth because just babbling affirmations didn't work all the time, and I couldn't understand why. I asked myself, what am I doing wrong? See, immediately I blamed myself. Was this one more example of me not being good enough? That was a favorite old belief of mine. At the time, my teacher, Eric Pace, would look at me and refer to the idea of resentment. I didn't have the faintest idea what he was talking about. Resentment? Me? Surely I didn't have any resentments. 
After all, I was on my pathway. I was spiritually perfect. How little I could see myself then. I continued doing the best I could in my life. I studied metaphysics and spirituality and learned about myself as much as possible. I grasped what I could and sometimes I applied it. Often we hear a lot of things and sometimes we grasp them, but we don't always practice them. Time seemed to go by very quickly and at that point I had been studying science of mind for about three years and had just become a practitioner of the church. I began to teach the philosophy, but I wondered why my students seemed to be floundering. I couldn't understand why they were so stuck in their problems. I gave them so much good advice. Why weren't they using it and getting well? It never dawned on me that I was speaking the truth more than I was living it. I was like a parent who tells the child what to do, but then does exactly the opposite. Then one day, seemingly out of the blue, I was diagnosed with vaginal cancer. First I panicked like anyone else. Then I had doubts that all this stuff I was learning was valid. It was a normal and natural reaction. I thought to myself, if I was clear and centered, I wouldn't have the need to create the illness. In hindsight, I think when I was diagnosed, I felt safe enough at that point to let the illness surface so that I could do something about it, rather than having it be another hidden secret that I wouldn't know about until I was dead. I knew too much by then to hide from myself any longer. I knew that cancer was a dis-ease of resentment that is held for a long time until it eats away at the body. When we stifle our emotions inside of us, they have to go somewhere in the body. If we spend a lifetime stuffing things down, they will eventually manifest somewhere in the body. I became very aware that the resentment within me, which my teacher had referred to so many times, had to do with being a physically, emotionally, and sexually abused as a child. Naturally, I would have resentment. I was bitter and unforgiving of the past. I had never done any work to change or release the bitterness and let it go. When I left home, it was all I could do to forget what had happened to me. I thought I had put it behind me when in actuality I had simply buried it. When I found my metaphysical pathway, I covered up my feelings with a nice layer of spirituality and hid a lot of garbage inside me. I put a wall around myself that kept me literally out of touch with my own feelings. I didn't know who I was or where I was. After my diagnosis, the real inner work of learning to know myself began. Thank God I had tools to use. I knew I needed to go within myself if I was going to make any permanent changes. Yes, the doctor could give me an operation and perhaps take care of my illness for the moment. But if I didn't change the way I was using my thoughts and my words, I'd probably recreate it again. It's always interesting to me to learn where in our bodies we put our cancers, our diseases on which side of the body, the left or the right. The right side represents the masculine side from where we give out. The left is the feminine side, the receptive part from where we take in. Almost all of my life, when anything went wrong, it was always on the right side of my body. It was where I stored all the resentment towards my stepfather and life. I was no longer content to get green lights and parking places. I knew I had to go much, much deeper. I realized that I was not really progressing in my life the way I wanted to because I hadn't really cleared out this old garbage from childhood and I wasn't living what I was teaching. I had to recognize the inner child inside me and work with her. 
My inner child needed help because she was still in great pain. I quickly began a self-healing program in earnest. I concentrated totally on me and did little else. I became very committed to getting well. Some of it was a little weird, yet I did it anyway. After all, this was my life on the line. It became almost a 24-hour-a-day job for the next six months. I began reading and studying everything I could find out about alternative ways to heal cancer because I truly believed it could be done. I did a nutritional cleansing program that detoxified my body from all the junk foods I had eaten for years. For months, I seemed to be living on sprouts and pureed asparagus. I know I had more to eat, but that is what I remember the most. I worked with my Science of Mind minister and teacher, Eric Pace, to clear the mental patterns so the cancer wouldn't return. I said affirmations and did visualizations, prayers, and spiritual mind treatments. I did daily sessions in front of a mirror. The most difficult words to say were, I love you, I really love you. It took a lot of tears and a lot of breathing to get through it. When I did, it was as if I took a quantum leap. I also went to a good psychotherapist who was skilled in helping people express and release their anger. I spent a long period of time beating pillows and screaming. It was wonderful. It felt so good because I had never, ever had permission to do that in my life. I don't know which method worked. Maybe a little bit of everything worked. Most of all, I was really consistent with what I did. I practiced during all my waking hours. I thanked myself before I went to sleep for what I had done during the day. I affirmed that my healing process was taking place in my body while I slept and that I would awaken in the morning bright and refreshed and feeling good. In the morning, I'd awaken and thank myself and my body for the work that was done during the night. I would affirm that I was willing to grow and learn each day and make changes without seeing myself as a bad person. I also worked on understanding and forgiveness. One of the ways was to explore my parents' childhoods as much as I could. I began to understand how they were treated as children, and I realized that because of the way they were brought up, they couldn't really have done anything differently than they did. My stepfather was abused at home, and he continued this abuse with his children. My mother was brought up to believe that the man was always right and you stood by and let him do what he wanted. No one taught them a different approach. It was their way of life. Step by step, my growing understanding of them enabled me to start the forgiveness process. The more I forgave my parents, the more willing I was to forgive myself. Forgiveness of ourselves is enormously important. Many of us do the same damage to the inner child that our parents did to us. We just continue the abuse, and it's very sad. When we were children and the other people mistreated us, we didn't have many options. But when we grow up and we still mistreat the inner child, it's disastrous. As I forgave myself, I began to trust myself. I found that when we don't trust life or other people, it's really because we don't trust ourselves. We don't trust our higher selves to take care of us in all situations. So we say, I'll never fall in love again because I don't want to get hurt, or I'll never let this happen again. We are really saying to ourselves, I don't trust you enough to take good care of me, so I'm going to stay away from everything. Eventually, I began to trust myself enough to take care of me, and I found it easier and easier to love myself once I trusted myself. My body was healing, and my heart was healing. My real spiritual growth had come in such an unexpected way. As a bonus, I began to look younger. 
The clients I now attracted were almost all people who were willing to work on themselves. They made enormous progress without me really doing anything. They could sense and feel that I was living the concepts I was teaching, and it was easy for them to accept these ideas. Of course they had positive results. They began to improve the quality of their lives. Once we begin to make peace with ourselves on the inner level, life seems to flow much more pleasantly. So what did this experience teach me personally? I realized that I had the power to change my life if I was willing to change my thinking and release the patterns that kept me living in the past. This experience gave me the inner knowledge that if we are willing, really willing to do the work, the mental work, we can make incredible changes in our minds, our bodies, and our lives. No matter where you are in life, no matter what you've contributed to creating, no matter what's happening, you are always doing the best you can with the understanding and awareness and knowledge that you have. And when you know more, you will do it differently as I did. Don't berate yourself for where you are. Don't blame yourself for not doing it faster or better. Say to yourself, I'm doing the best I can. And even though I'm in a mess now, I will get out of it somehow. So let's find the best way to do it. If all you do is tell yourself that you're stupid and no good, then you stay stuck. You need your own loving support if you want to make changes. The methods I use are not my methods. Most of them I learned at Science of Mind, which is what I basically teach. Yet these principles are as old as time. If you read any of the old spiritual teachings, you will find the same messages. I am trained as a minister of the Church of Religious Science. However, I do not have a church. I am a free spirit. I express the teachings in simple language so that they may reach many people. This path is a wonderful way of getting your head together and really understanding what life is all about and how you can use your own mind to take charge of your life. When I started all this over 20 years ago, I had no idea that I would be able to bring hope and help to the number of people that I do today. Everything you need to know is revealed to you, and everything you need comes to you. Thank you for listening. I love you.